Hello, I'm Ron Jenkins, director of the Columbus Symphony Orchestra Chorus, and we're here today to share you some information and invite you to attend the American Festival, which the orchestra and chorus will present on Friday and Saturday, October 11 and 12 at 7.30 p.m. at the Ohio Theater. So I'm going to get information about tickets right away so that you know, because at the end of this video, you're going to want to attend. Tickets can be purchased through www.columbussymphony.com or at the Kappa Ticket Center, 614-469-0939. I have two guests with me today that are going to be talking about this particular program. Eric Hirschthal. Eric, introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, my name is Eric Hirschthal, and I am a postdoctoral fellow in the African American and African Studies Department at Ohio State University, and I'm um, a historian of slavery uh, who see my PhD at Columbia, uh, and I'm finishing a book on the anti-slavery movement. Wonderful. And Arthur Marks? Arthur W. Marks. I am a member of the Symphony Chorus, and uh, I'm absolutely enjoying working on this particular piece. And you yourself were a soloist and also and a sung with orchestras around the country, absolutely. Including, including the Columbus the, Symphony just absolutely. Last, last season, and you will be again in this Holiday season. Pops in December. Right. So the program, the American Festival, is historically timely um, because of the time, 2019. We are pre giving the Midwest premiere of Moravec's Sanctuary Road, which was just given its first performance in New York City in 2018. It's the story is based on William Still's book, The Underground Railway, and tells the stories of five slaves escaping from the South to freedom in the North and ultimately to Canada. The second half of the program will be uh, Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. So, why don't you give us just a little background of historically what we're dealing with in, in this time period and, and the importance of it really in this uh, year of 2019. Absolutely. Um, so maybe first just to start with uh, the story of, of Wel William Still and his involvement in the broader Underground Railroad. Um, many Was people it a railroad? Uh, no, as right. we say, as Precise. we tell to every fourth grader who uh, who eventually inevitably asked that question. So no, it was a metaphor that was used at the time because the railroad was just uh, coming uh, into being, and um, and it was very useful to to uh, sort of use it as a as a as a figurative way of discussing about these sort of secretive escape routes right. um, that were first and foremost uh, decided uh, not fully planned out, but by an enslaved person, him or herself. Um, I think uh, part about talking about the Underground Railroad is is really uh, telling what it wasn't. Um, it was far less organized than we like to think it was, um, and in fact, it was much more informal. Uh, the main people in the story of the underground world were not even uh, the black or white abolitionists who helped. It was the enslaved people themselves who first and foremost decided to escape. Um, and they are the person who initiated the entire process uh, of escaping to the North, and eventually, if they could, to Canada, which, as part of the British Empire, was entirely free. Right. Um, so uh, maybe I think the, the most important thing to highlight for the sake of, of this podcast, uh, I'm sorry, for this um, symphony, is that it's centering around William Still and his kind of first diary uh, that was published uh, a few years after the Civil War of the over 800 fugitive slaves who he helped as a central coordinator in Philadelphia. Um, what's unique about it is that William Still is first and foremost a black man. Uh, overwhelmingly, the, the stories, uh, this has changed a lot, uh, particularly among uh, uh, historians of slavery since the 1960s, but the public may be less aware. Uh, but in the public imagination, it's a happy story, white and black people working together to help fugitive slaves. Um, unfortunately, even before the 1960s, the story was overwhelmingly a story of white good guys helping poor slaves run away. Yeah. Um, and historians have, p particularly because people like William Still, uh, and after, since the 1960s, the civil rights movement and onward, uh, historians are much more interested in seeing, hold on, what, what role were black people playing. And it turns out they were far more consistent uh, and far more um, likely to be the people, the communities in the North, the free black communities in the North, to be helping enslaved people. Um, right, because not everyone in the North was in favor of, uh, or of helping slaves escape. Uh, Many of them still believed in, in slavery. In fact, bounty hunters were prevalent in the state of Ohio, absolutely. trying to capture absolutely. slaves and return them. One of the churches, I understand, actually down on um, East Broad Street, mm -hmm. First Congregation, mm -hmm. was founded in 1851 as an abolitionist church, so a group of white people here that was mm -hmm. definitely against, against slavery and did help. 
Absolutely. So you have both those stories, um, of course, of white uh, people helping. But it's important to realize if we're looking at numbers, uh, we should we should certainly uh, talk about and admire the white abolitionist figures. But what they were uh, incredibly the minority within their community, even in the north. Right. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about that, you know, uh, it's really important that we realize that uh, abolitionists, black and white, um, they were not popular. Uh, even if you, uh, it's in a similar way, you know, because analogies, we talk about this history because it is relevant for sort of racism today. Um, and the analogy is, you know, a lot of people say, hey, you know, racism is wrong, but Black Lives Matter is going about it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Similarly, abolitionists, slavery is wrong, but the abolitionists are going about it the wrong way. Right. They're, they're polarizing the nation. Uh, they were lawbreakers. Uh, it was legal, um, and the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, but you know, there was a, a weaker law on the books in 1793, criminalized people, black and white, in the North for helping fugitive slaves run away. These people were deliberately saying, we are breaking the national law, and after the 1850s, many of them, a particular black abolitionists, were willing to arm themselves and shoot those slave catchers who were coming into their community to take away. Nobody, white people in particular, even if they were opposed to slavery, liked that. Right. Um, so we have to appreciate the, in, in retrospect, it's courageous and, and, and admirable, but if we really want to see the difficult position they were in, and again, predominantly black people, they were not doing something popular. Uh, so this piece, uh, uh, Sanctuary Road, mm -hmm. tells the story of slaves trying to escape, mm -hmm. and William Still's character is sung by, by a bass, mm -hmm. and he sort of narrates it. Arthur, why don't you tell us about some of the solo, soloists that are gonna be um, singing with us in this production? Sure, well we have five soloists, uh, four of which are characters within the piece, and then we have the bass who is, is the narrator. He's sort of like the evangelist in St. John St. or St. Matthew Passion of Bach. Absolutely. He, he helps Absolutely. narrate. Yeah. Helps narrate the story. Um, and the voicing is we have a soprano, a mezzo-soprano, tenor, baritone, and then bass, which is not always the case in pieces of this nature. It's usually we have just the four voices that cover it all, but to have that fifth adds a different element to the particular piece. Um, the first of the soprano, uh, Laquita Mitchell, um, a very renowned young lady. Um, I actually happened to work with her in New York Did you? years ago. I was so pleased to see her name. Very talented, extremely And wasn't she gifted. in on the premiere in New York she City a year ago? She was in the premiere. Right. There were three that were a part of the original premiere. Uh, the soprano, Laquita Mitchell, the uh, bass, um, Deshaun, and uh, the baritone as well. Uh, Malcolm Merriweather right. um, was a part of the original, and I should say Deshaun's last name is Burton. Right. Um, but they, the three of them were in the premiere. Now the two newbies uh, to the piece are the mezzo-soprano uh, soprano Melody Miller and uh, the tenor Noah Stewart, right. um, who is also a fantastic singer. Right. I actually sang in a piece with him when he was a kid. Um, Did you? I'm an old man. But uh, Is yeah. he the one that got his uh, career started when he was 12 doing so, vo voiceovers for Sesame Street? He did. I he thought did. so, yeah. And uh, was brought up in the Harlem School of Music. That's right. Um, in a very pre prestigious uh, school, to say the least, uh, in New York. So, uh, But their voicings, what I love about the piece is that their voicings are quite beautifully written, but also an, a singer's dream. Um, as a soloist, um, I love when I can get my sink my teeth into a piece that gives me the op opportunity to act right. and to really embody a character. And this particular piece absolutely does that. Um, and you know, I think sometimes people are um, turned off or frightened by contemporary music, twentieth, twenty first century, because it's um, often very dissonant, right. and some people may describe it as difficult to listen to. Uh, this piece is very contemporary, but it's still tonal. And every once in a while you get a beautiful major chord and just it's just it's like a breath of fresh air or a cool breeze throwing through the room because he creates a lot of chaos in the music. Absolutely. It's a frightening story. These are people running away, For trying to escape slavery. They know if they are caught, they will be shot or hung. Mm -hmm. that, and at least uh, that will happen to them. So uh, there's a lot of fear and a lot of agitation in, in the music that we in the chorus get to sing. Absolutely, and I think one of the beautiful things about the piece is that it gives you the heightened drama of an opera, 
but the sensitivity of a musical theater piece. Beautifully, um, beautifully and said. And I love that uh, simply because I've been in both of those worlds, and to to have that combination uh, is absolutely remarkable, because you as an audience member will get the opportunity to be engaged and in it, and not feel like it's over the top, as some operas can be. Um, but as musical theater, we get we get caught up in the characters and how they're connected and what their journey and story is before and afterwards. So it's really remarkable that it captures all of that in one piece. And you will feel as an audience member that you are a part of their journey. There's no separating yourselves. Once that downbeat starts, you will be engaged, and that's what's so fantastic. So the chorus, I think, acts a little bit like a Greek chorus and an ancient Greek drama. Mm -hmm. Comments on the action is sometimes part of the action. Right. So sometimes the chorus is acting as uh, the bounty hunters mm -hmm. and chasing after them. And then sometimes the chorus is supporting the slaves and helping them to escape and, and run and, and to be not look back and right. keep going forward. Don't look back. Don't look back. Um, it, it's the stories that, that I think those stories the soloists tell. And it begins with the narrator, you know, saying all their names, mm -hmm. which is profound. So, which will connect us into our first rehearsal on this piece, which I want to talk about. But tell us again about the significance of, of 2019 and 400th year of uh, commemoration of what? Of, of so absolutely so this happens at a very um, fortuitous time 1619 400 years ago the first enslaved Africans came to what was British North America mm -hmm. um, this is as we know um, you know historians uh, know this history well uh, African American communities have been commemorating it uh, across the country since um, since 2018 actually mm -hmm. um, but the New York Times to their credit I'm an avid New York Times reader uh, Nicole Hannah Jones uh, an African American journalist there and, and MacArthur Fellow and all of everything else. Um, she's an she, amazing person. She's an amazing. I, I got to hear her speak uh, at Chautauqua, New York, this summer, oh, and okay. she kept four thousand people absolutely hypnotized. Yeah, she's she. Yeah, she's. Uh, I've never met her, but um, but I've also listened to um, uh, her podcast, which you know, on the New York Times, right. which we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But so so she's. Uh, you know, there was a, a bit of controversy because it was a very. Uh, the argument of the of the of the piece, and this is why six six nineteen is really is really important. Is you know, um, we like to tell stories about America and the founding of freedom. Uh, well, sixteen nineteen uh, is is uh, another kind of founding, uh, and it's not only the founding of freedom, but also of course of slavery in America uh, that far precedes seventeen seventy six, the American Revolution. Um, and there's another sort of she she touches on it in her lead essay, but uh, sixteen nineteen, uh, and there's been many books that have been written about it. James Horn uh, at the Williamsburg Foundation published a, a, a mainstream book. But the House of Burgess, the first um, sort of uh, somewhat democratic uh, house of elected officials in Virginia, is also created in 1619 for white people only. And of course, white people with land, poor white people cannot vote. Um, so the irony is that you actually do have, in a very in a very short time frame, the birth of the first democratic sort of colonial assembly in, in colonial Virginia, coming at the very same year as the first enslaved people, 20, uh, roughly 20, uh, in America. Uh, and of course, while nothing is inevitable. Uh, it takes actually quite quite a few decades for uh, black people. It's not until the 1670s that actually black people become the the fundamental uh, enslaved force. There were indentured servants uh, that were far outnumbering slaves before then. Um, but nonetheless, symbolically, it's important because it's the first recorded uh, date that we have of African people showing up in British North America. Right. So it, it this it's timely. Timely and, we're, and we are fortunate that our music director, Rasa Milanov, who will be conducting this concert, mm -hmm. um, knew about this and, and is bringing this piece to Columbus, Ohio. It's, it's a major coup musically and culturally for our city Absolutely. to be giving uh, the Midwest premiere of this particular piece. I want, I want to read to you um, what the composer said about the piece and about it, writing it. And excuse me for reading because I don't have it memorized. He says of his process, Morevic says, time is the medium of music and memory is the mediator. In its sublime, mysterious way, music remembers. Composing the music for this oratorio, I was guided by my intention to memorialize indelibly the spirit and events of this extraordinary chapter in American history. As William Still sings about the slaves he aided on their road to freedom, their testimony 
will never be forgotten. So, and he says that very clearly, like, write it down, every detail. And he kept incredible records. I mean, he kept copies of tickets and letters that he received from slaves who wanted to get out or, or after they escaped to freedom. He meticulous detail, and he saved it all in a graveyard and then went back after the war was over and because he was afraid of his notes being found. And so he went back there and found those notes and put them together. And so Mark Campbell put the librettist for this, who has worked with, I believe, Paul before. And by the way, in both of them, both the composer and the rest will be at these performances oh, wow. and there to talk. Yes, we're bringing them from New York to talk to the audience uh, before the performance of the particular piece. But he, William Stills, he says, don't ever forget this. And our problem with history is if we don't remember, if we don't write it down, mm -hmm. then we are doomed to repeat right. horrible things again. And we know that certainly from other Absolutely. atrocities that have happened uh, in our world and in our history. Well, I think what we're going to do is take just a little back break at this point and come back and talk about uh, a little more about this piece and Porgy and Bess. Welcome back. We're here talking about the American Festival, the Columbus Symphony Orchestras and Choruses' first major concert together this fall, October 11 and 12, Friday and Saturday evening at 7.30 p.m., at the Ohio Theater, conducted by our music director, Ross Milinoff. There will be over 200 performers on stage, orchestra, chorus, and five world-renowned soloists. This piece, Sanctuary Road, is historically important, and we had our first rehearsal on August 20th, 2019, just about a month ago, and it was historically important because that was the 400th anniversary commemorating the first Africans being brought by the British to British North America and the beginning of slavery in our land. So our first rehearsal when we were doing this piece, Arthur, I remember it so dramatically um, because it's a true story Absolutely. we were telling about slaves escaping and their names were there. And I remember a baritone in the back row raised his hand mm -hmm. and said, Ron, these are real people we're talking about here, aren't we, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And he said, could we have a moment of silence? Because this really happened. Tell them about what it felt like it's, to be sitting in that room at that time. Not to be overly dramatic, but a hush literally fell over the room. And it was almost as if, if I can paint it, it was like we became still. And actually, it felt like everyone was on one accord. Mm -hmm. uh, it was incredibly powerful. Um, and when we came back from that moment of silence, the energy was transformed. And we were then even more transfixed with the piece. Uh, it, it was just beautiful. And it meant more, I think, to some of us, especially the Africans and African-Americans in the room. Uh, but everyone really felt the meaning of the piece, the significance of what we were doing here with this premiere. Uh, it, it just changed our entire, the energy of the room. It was absolutely magical. Magical. Because it touches your heart. Oh, sure. And you can't absolutely. really be a good performer of music unless you are willing to put your heart into absolutely. it. Absolutely. And this this piece is, is powerful in that way. Uh, the first time we actually learned that phrase, runaway, runaway slave, and I, I got goose flesh. <laughs> yeah. I really did. And I was so excited that they were excited about it and they understood the importance of it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first half of our concert, right. <laughs> is telling the story of this in incredible piece based on the writings of William Still, uh, telling the real stories of slaves escaping. And, and I, I'd love to go into some of the, the words, but the words that they sing, it's an oratorio, mm -hmm. so it's not staged. It's just singers, chorus and orchestra, and singers telling these powerful story. And at the end, when they've reached freedom and we are all singing that word free, it's, it's magnificent. So we want you to be a part of that, of getting to hear that. The second half of the concert yes. is not a true story, but nonetheless very moving. Right. Porgy and Bess, and we're doing a concert presentation of it. Porgy and Bess, written by George Gershwin, and um, based 
first on a novel written in, I think, 1924 by Hayward uh, called Porgy. Porgy. And then he and his wife put it together into a play, and Gershwin took that, and with Hayward as the lyricist and Ira Gershwin as also co-lyricist, wrote the folk opera, Gershwin calls it, Porgy and Bess. And it's a wonderful love story, poignant, sad, but wonderful also, between Bess, this beautiful woman, in the slums of Char uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and Porgy, a disabled person, mm -hmm. and uh, Bess's man that she is in relationship with, Crown, who is totally evil. Oh, absolutely. Uh, a murderer, mm -hmm. and Sport in Life, who is um, not the comic, really, but he's certainly... Uh, well, he sings uh, ain't necessarily so in, in that, which he takes off on the, some of those tales you hear in the Bible aren't necessarily true. And it's really, but, but the bad thing about him is that he is a drug He's sales a drug person. Dealer. He's a drug dealer and a cocaine dealer. So this wonderful story between all of these people, Gershwin actually went to Charleston, South Carolina and lived for a while because he wanted to experience that community. Um, but I believe James Baldwin also said something about this piece, didn't he? Yes, he, he did. Like many African-Americans have said, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the quote on me. Um, but the idea of what he said, it was in, in a very James Baldian way, uh, you know, epitomizing what this uh, opera meant for white people versus black people. And, and to paraphrase, what, what he was getting at was white liberals, right? Keep in mind, this isn't white conservatives who would, had no interest in seeing this, would basically, you know, this assuage white liberal guilt, right? Uh, you know, he are, we are willing to show a kind of simplistic, good black, you know, simple but good black people, even with their problems. Um, and it made them felt, it made many white people, particularly the symphony goers and opera goers, um, feel good to support an opera that was, you know, a high art opera uh, that was portraying, you know, the low black life uh, in a way that they didn't mean to be demeaning, but to black Americans obviously was demeaning. And of course, in the other quote, he also says, well, this many African Americans uh, in the civil rights movement, when the first time we're hearing a really loud cry uh, in the modern, in the 20th century of, of African Americans, uh, you know, he shows that black Americans were very disappointed, and they had always been. Uh, if you read black newspapers in the 1930s, they were also against it. The one caveat, and this is maybe just the last thing I'll say, um, uh, with regard to Porgy and Bess, is it was also a very difficult position for black singers, both in the 1930s and afterwards, right? Because on the one hand, it was a demeaning caricature of African Americans. On the other, it was one of the rare opportunities where they were deliberately sought out. Gershwin, in fact, made it a point that he only wanted black singers to play this role. It, yeah. It and so, Afri and that, that, that arguably still remains a problem with Porgy and Bess, right? There are very few uh, roles where black people are deliberately, sort of black stories are told, and obviously we don't want to be doing blackface anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, 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 and so often black people are forced to play roles that were written in moments that it, were written in ways that are, are unlike uh, Paul Morovich's opera, which is much more empathetic and is much more uh, earnest about how it portrays black right. lives. Well, it's a difference. Of what? Of 70 years. Yes, right. Yeah, so, uh, so that's, um, yeah. We have come, a, a, fortunately, a long way in our history and in our understanding and our inclusivity. I mean, when this was written in, in uh, when first performance premiered in Boston in 1935, and then a month later went to uh, New York City for its production there. And they, he used all classically, musically trained African-American mm -hmm. singers in the role. And I think that has always been the case. And as you said, Gershwin said, this must be always done this way mm -hmm. with African-Americans playing these parts. But then when they went on a national tour, they ran into problems, which were current problems in society in the United States in 1935. So they went on tour and they went to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., to perform at the um, National Theater and they decided then, the producers of the show there decided that there would be a performance for blacks only mm -hmm. because black African-Americans could not buy a ticket mm -hmm. to see Porgy and Bess mm -hmm. because the theaters were segregated, just segregated, just as restaurants and hotels and everything was segregated, mm -hmm. even, you know, even in, in the North and most places. So the gentleman playing, I can't recall his name right now, but playing Porgy mm -hmm. stepped forward and he said, we're not going to perform. If, if I can't buy a ticket 
and my family can't buy a ticket to see us perform at a regular performance, then we are not going to perform. And so the National Theater relented, and for the first time, there were integrated audiences mm -hmm. in, in Washington, D.C., which was historically important. Now, did that carry through? No, as we well know, and it took the civil rights movement and mm -hmm. desegregation of the school and all the things that were going to happen in the, in the ensuing decades. And there's been a period of, I think, in our history in which African Americans were, you know, had mixed feelings about, about this piece. But I think today uh, we're past it. I think there's a, a pride that uh, African American soloists are or front and center, and this piece uh, is, you know, struck a heart. And granted, uh, what you say is all true, but I think there's been an involvement, for the most part, of the general public's attitude about it. And again, it's it's so wonderful because it's been performed, I think, in New York on Broadway, um, seven seven different product, major productions. But the last one was 2012. And Columbus is doing this at the same time the Metropolitan Opera oh, is bringing, right, bringing it back, it back. Yeah. this yeah. fall and producing Porgy and Bess. That wasn't planned, was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's kind of another coup yeah. for, for Columbus Symphony Orchestra yeah. that we are doing this. These two pieces, one telling a historically important um, story about the Underground Railway, and the other one, although it's just it's fiction, uh, there is some historically uh, information that it's there and but also there's the proud I think that pride that we can feel about this music is beautiful but once again both stories told by white composers right. Gershwin and Paul Moravec right um, so I guess my hope is someday that story will be told by black com right. by African-American composers right um, and and then I think we will have really come full story I think one of the things as you all were talking here that struck me as interesting, in 1927, U.B. Blake was the first African-American composer to have his play and muse with music right. put on Broadway. It was the most successful musical that had ever been done. All African-American cast wow. by an African-American composer. And many people saw Porgy and Bess as a way for African-Americans to go, okay, we've got another champion, but it came in a different form. Right. And then that question that, that that question then arose for everyone: Can our can our lives be t taught or shown authentically by someone that is not of our skin or our hue? Can it be? And when Porgy and Bess came out, many were of the African American community were sort of put off by it simply because it told a different perspective that we don't always like to talk about: the drug abuse the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the disability abuse. Right. Um, those things we didn't want to talk about. We don't want to present that aspect of us because it's not the whole aspect of us. So I find it um, beautiful that we are starting to see more productions. Within this year, there will be four productions of Poor Game Best mm. done by major opera and performance companies. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we show that, uh, and put the piece out there, it gives a sense of pride, especially poor for Pormer. I've played Sport and Life several times. Have you? And it's a, it's a great, wonderful role. Um, you're not always liked <laughs> by the, the audience because of what your character portrayed, but it still has a point. It still has significance. And I think by us doing it here in Columbus, um, I would hope that the audience will go away from that going, this is a brilliant piece. It is a piece that highlights a community that doesn't always get that opportunity to be showcased, um, but it also gives you a moment to pause and to reflect on how you see yourself as an outsider or an insider. And I think that's important. Um, I find that every time I come to Poor Game Best, I find something new. And that's coming from an African-American male. Uh, it, it still, I hear that first beat, that downbeat of the music, and I'm moved every single time. There's not one time that I've never been touched or moved by that piece, simply because it is, it's a way for me as a as an, uh, performer, as a soloist, as an actor, to go, this is a piece that was written specifically for my, for my folk, mm -hmm. and I have the opportunity to be a part of that, whether it's a pretty history or not, even though it's fictional, it still is important. 
And Gershwin really made a huge effort to, oh. for it to be authentic. Oh, absolutely. As best as he could do it. Absolutely. And what I love, that Ger one of the things that Gershwin did is that he was always in communication with his performers. Right. Is this okay? Do, how do you feel about this? Am I overdoing it? Am I taking too much liberty? Like there was never a moment where he did something within the piece that he did not ask, how do you feel about this? And that's rare. That's very rare. You get sometimes you get a piece and it is the way it is, you know. And and twenty years on Broadway, I will tell you, there are many times where, as a performer, I would like to go. Oh, I'm not so comfortable with this, and you don't have that <laughs> voice. It's like this is the piece. This is the way it is. So for Gershwin to take upon himself to go, you know what? I don't want you to feel like I'm shoving this down your throat. That you have no say in this. That your voice doesn't matter. Please speak up. And that's a beautiful thing because then it really allowed the performers to have a say in how they performed the piece and what was significant to them was also significant to him. And the music's beautiful. Absolutely I mean, that gorgeous. opening summertime, oh. I mean, it's been recorded by so many people over the years. Over I mean, it's years. huge. Everyone knows that piece. Absolutely. But also the main character, Porgy, I mean, with the difficulties that he lived with, such positive at the ending when he takes off for New York, he's going to find Bess, come so to hell or high water, he it. is going to do it. Right. And he's a positive, strong African American man making a major statement about the woman he loves Absolutely. and what he's going to do. Right. To, to and find if you've her. ever seen the production in that moment, through the whole production, he's um, with his cane at times walking because of his disability and his leg. Um, and in that moment, the strength that he embodies, and he drops that king and turns and walks. Even with that slight limp, he was proud to go after the woman he loved. And it is powerful. It is absolutely breathtaking to watch this man who has been so downtrodden through the entire piece, to take that courage, to take that first step without leaning on that, leaning on others, leaning on that king, leaning on his own sorrow and uh, uh, negativity. Um, he, he said, no more, no more. I'm going to hold my head hell high and I'm going to go get my woman. And it is, that's, for me, that is what I take away from it. No matter what your circumstance, you can hold your head up and move forward. It may take a bit, but you can do it. Thank you. So, have we absolutely convinced you to be at the Ohio Theater either Friday evening, October 11, or Saturday evening, October 12, for the American Festival to hear the Midwest premiere of Moravec's Sanctuary Road and Gershwin's beautiful and poignant Porgy and Bess sung in concert. You can obtain tickets by going to the symphony's website, www.columbussymphony.com, or calling the Kappa Ticket Center, 614-469-0939. This is Ron Jenkins, conductor of the Columbus Symphony Chorus. It's been our privilege to be here with you. Eric, Arthur, thank you for your insight into this music, into the history. You gentlemen added so much to all of this. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. Thank you. thank you. And we'll see you October 11 or 12.